Hello, welcome back to my channel. Uh, today we are going to be doing my July wrap up. I read 14 books with two DNFs. Um, this book, this month had some really good reads in it. Um, so I am excited to talk about some of this stuff. Um, we'll, we'll see if that compensates for um, having no notes again. Again, we're just, we're just going to go with it. Okay, uh, so the first book I finished was Wicked Intentions by Elizabeth Hoyt. This is the first book in the Maiden Lane series. Um, I actually talked about this in my June wrap-up because I talked about it in conjunction with the first book I read, which was book four. Um, so if you want thoughts on that one, um, it's in the previous wrap-up. It was good. It was good. It wasn't as good as book four, but it was solid. Uh, so the second book I finished, I listened to the audiobook of Dying of Whiteness, How the Politics of Racial Resentment is Killing America's Heartland by Jonathan M. Metzl. And that was narrated by Jamie Rennell. Rennell? Rennell. Um, I will list all of the authors and narrators in the description box, should you like to reference them. Um, so this was a nonfiction I picked up on recommendation from books like Woe. So this is a um, investigative journalism nonfiction written by a psychologist. So it's, it's, so it's an investigative journalism kind of written from a psychology sociology standpoint. Um, and it focuses on three main issues that um, are predominant in conservative and Midwest and rural American areas and are fairly divisive topics among um, politically conservative and politically liberal people, uh, Americans. Um, and that is uh, gun violence, um, sp specifically focuses on gun suicide, um, healthcare and uh, who's paying for it, and uh, education. Um, so, so, and in each section, he kind of focuses on one region um, so, we'll fo so yeah, each section he kind of focuses on one topic and then specifically focuses on one region that has, uh, some particular legislation that affects each of these areas. It was weird listening to it on the audio because there's like some graphs and other images that are kind of hard to visualize when you are just listening to it. So if you were thinking of getting into this, just know that like... There are some like graphs and things that are like list or discussed or um, described in uh, the audiobook, but I personally I do not find <laughs> I was very grateful to have a visual uh, representation of those things um, just so I could I'm definitely more of a visual person. If you just start listening about listing a bunch of numbers for me, um, I cannot hold them in my head for nothing. Um, but anyway, so like, but yeah, this was, it was very interesting in, in terms of like the data that supported it. So it's like, how, like the format of this is very methodical and I kind of liked it because it was kind of like, here's the issue, here's the data, and then here are some personal anecdotes. Like, and like everything kind of revolves around this question of like, why, why? Why does it seem that people in these regions and of these political affiliations are voting against their own interests? What, what, what's going on? Um, and I, I, there is definitely not like an easy answer to those questions. Um, the thing with gun violence, like here's an astounding statistic with gun violence, 90%, 90% of all gun suicides are committed by white males like as um, I feel like in statistics of like causes of death or or like breakdowns by gender and um, ethnicity like very rarely do you find something that is so overwhelmingly one category um, and the big takeaway about the thing with guns is there is legislation in place I forget exactly I forget exactly what it is, but there is legislation in place that prevents federal funding for any study that links guns and death <laughs> or like that links 
guns and suicide or something like it's it's something that the gun lobby managed to put in place so now it is almost impossible to study gun violence and gun study uh, and sorry gun violence and gun suicide as a health crisis even though in comparing it to all other causes of death and all other causes of suicide it is a fucking health crisis but at least on a federal funding level we're not allowed to talk about it like that um, and I think this is also kind of reflected in the language of the people who talk about this because a lot of people in these regions like the common narrative is well guns are just a part of our life you know we've always been hunters we've always had guns in the house like they, they don't see guns as a thing that like doesn't have to be there but it is a thing that is different where people will talk about like well if if you know someone had re reached out to this person with depression if we knew the signs if they had known to call a suicide hotline but like nobody talks about the guns as being a factor that is negotiable because for them it is it's it's like the air you breathe it's oh it's there like why would it not be there you know and and for these people like for them like guns mean safety like whether that's just like marketing bullshit or whatever what it, whatever it's gone on for enough generations so like for them they're like yeah when i feel unsafe i feel safer with a gun or i feel safer knowing that my partner owns a gun and here i am in liberal heartland america being like i don't want a gun in the fucking building like and it, it's i don't think you know, I don't think like examining one region or one group of people can answer the question of like, why have we developed such different ideas about it? I think it does serve the purpose of the whole book of like, it's not just that like they refuse to see guns as dangerous, it's that they are literally immersed in a culture that doesn't see them as dangerous, so why would they? Um, so anyway, so that's just one section of it. Um, you know, and the thing with healthcare, you know, it's a common thread of, it's, it's kind of like there is this, the common thread there is government control. Like, um, that's a huge question of the perception of, you know, how, how much, like, what, what is the government's responsibility? Like, how much does the government get to be a part of your health decisions, your personal decisions, um, you know, and what is the role of, what do you think the appropriate role of the government is in your life? Is like one side of that issue and the other side is people are like, I don't want to approve healthcare policies that will pay for an undocumented person or a criminalized person or someone who's a drug addict, you know, it's just like, I, I would suffer, I would rather suffer than know that if I get help, you'll get help. And, you know, that's one that, like, I have trouble <laughs> wrapping, not wrapping my head around, but also, like, I know it's there. It's hard to, like, talk about in a summary. <laughs> Uh, oh shit, I've talked about this book for like 10 minutes. Okay, uh, and the last thing about education, like a big takeaway from that is that like loss of education, like loss of education can correlate directly to loss of years lived. So like there is a correlation between someone who doesn't have a high school diploma and life expectancy or the rate at which they will contract cancer or contract heart disease or like there's all of these correlations that um are compelling in terms of investing in education is you know it's like when you choose to not invest in education it leads to people dying earlier and dying in poverty and dying from preventable circumstances um you know, not necessarily for every single person who had their education compromised, but like there is that correlation. It's like a kind of a narrow focus, but I think it does a good job of like showing what's complicated and showing, at least like for me, again, living in super educated liberal heartland, of just like recognizing that these people are living in a different 
world. They are hearing different things from the cradle to the grave. You know, the news is different. The, the, their politicians are, you know, the language of their politicians are different. The language in their textbooks is different. You know, the, the commercials that play in, on their television are different. So like, it makes sense that their impressions of something would be different because they're literally li living in a different world with a different narrative. Um, and I think like that context is important if you're going to dare to judge people <laughs> for what they are or are not doing. Anyway, summary, it's interesting. It's really interesting. It is not a linear names, dates, places, history. It is just like a, a close up snapshot of like trying to wrap your head around some of these things that like, you know, from my perspective, just seem kind of baffling. Um, I, d I wouldn't dare to say like, I walked away completely understanding it, but it, it did kind of like stretch my critical thinking muscles and like my compassion muscles. So hurrah. Okay, we're gonna, I've been talking for like 15 minutes about one book. I'm hopefully gonna edit that the fuck down. Okay, next book. The next book I finished was also excellent. Um, prob probably one of the best nonfictions I've read all year, if not one of the best books I've read all year. This will probably come as no surprise. This was Ace, What Asexuality Reveals About Desire, Soci Society, and the Meaning of Sex by Angela Chen. So while this book focuses on asexuality and like what it is, what it isn't, how it has been represented, it, represented and how it is absent of representation, it's really a look at compulsory sexuality, um, meaning that it's this assumption that to have sexual desire is normal and if you don't have it or if you don't express it the right way or if you don't have enough of it then there must be something wrong with you um, and the easiest example is you know the prevalence of <laughs> the little blue pill and then like this endless pursuit for the viagra equivalent for women and it's like well where is this discussion of but maybe some people having less sexual desire is fine is fine. Um, so, you know, and it does kind of like talk about the spectrum of allosexual, which is somebody who experiences physical sexual desire, emotional sexual desire, desires physical intimacy, relationship intimacy, and it also does a great job of, of distinguishing between physical desire, intimacy desire, companionship desire, and it really kind of breaks down attraction and desire into all of these different facets and showing that humanity has a huge spectrum of people who have a lot of one thing and not a lot of another. Some people are sex repulsed, some people like sex but eh, could, could do without and some people are like kind of consumed by it and like the whole spectrum should be kind of accepted. And it's like, you know, human beings are this whole spectrum and we've kind of, our society is very much wrapped around the idea of like, it is normal and healthy to have these desires. And if you don't, something's wrong with you. And this book really challenges that idea of like, no, <laughs> people are, a lot of this is a normal part of the spectrum. It is more prevalent than you realize. And if we could just fucking talk about it, more people would be happy about it. Like a lot of people who struggle with having low sex drive or whatever, a lot of it comes from the idea that, well, they're supposed to have a sex drive. And if you just remove that assumption, well, maybe they would otherwise be fine. Um, anyway, so there's a lot, so, Again, so like, yeah, it kind of, it uses the narrative of asexuality as a way to unpack a lot of our society's expectations about desire and relationships and really just challenge what is possible in terms of what will make you happy and healthy and satisfied in your relationship. And um, it's really great and really validating. <laughs> um, Hurrah. <laughs> um, oh, I also really liked that in there's like an intro where the author kind of has like this little disclaimer of like, I'm focused on US centric stories. 
and I'm focused on, I don't know, she says, like, her own background. So she's basically saying, like, I'm focused on, like, like U.S. and Canadian-centric stories, and I recognize the importance of having stories from other parts of the world and other cultures, but that is not what this book is. Um, so I think she, it's, it's just like a great little thing of, of just like setting you up to have reasonable expectations of like, I know that this is not the whole story, um, but I am not the person to tell those parts of the story. Um, so if that's what you're looking for, this is not it and that's okay. Um, but here, here is what you can expect and hopefully that will be a good starting point for you. I think everyone I've seen who has read this has said it's a great read and it's a must read and yep, I totally agree. Yep. <laughs> um, really great. I have already <laughs> brought it up in casual conversation with people of being like, you know, I read a book that talks about this idea that's kind of relevant to what we're talking about now. Um, anyway, okay. Um, all right, so the next book I read uh, was Shadow and Bone by Leigh Bardugo. I wanted to watch the show, um, and I hadn't read any of the Shadow and Bone trilogy books yet. So I finally read the first one, and then... So I saw that, like, some of the Six of Crows characters were in the trailer. So I was, like, trying to figure out, like, well, they're not in the first book. Do they make an appearance in the second or third book? And then... I looked it up and it's like, no, 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 there's an original storyline featuring these characters in the show. So, um, if you've only read the first book, that's pretty much what is in the first season, except I believe maybe the very, very ending. It, it, it's fine. <laughs> um, you know, uh, you know, I've got, at the time that I watched it, it was, I was, there was still like a 12 week wait list for the next book in the series and I was impatient. Anyway, um, the book. What can I say about the book? I definitely prefer the heist setup and I definitely prefer the, prefer the multiple POV setup that we saw in um, Six of Crows. Um, this one was definitely a bit more YA romance focused, which I didn't love because it 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 felt so naive and incomplete, which I think is kind of the point. That's kind of the arc of Alina's um, relationship with the Darkling is she really doesn't fucking know anything about him. <laughs> um, and like by the end of the book, I'm like, and we don't either. Like. I, he, he, this is a character that I've heard people talk about on booktube and I walked away from the book being like well I hope we learn more about him in the second and third book because I would like to think he's interesting but the, the point is like I don't know anything about him so like I cannot say that I am a Darkling fan yet because I don't know anything about him all I know is what other people have assumed about him I don't know I'm not sold I'm not sold. Maybe that's because I'm not reading this as like a 21 year old. I'm reading this as a 30 year old. Um, but anyway, so I, I did really like um, learning more about the Grisha magic system. I'm interested in the world. I am less interested in these characters. Okay, let's just leave it there and move the fuck on. Okay. Okay. Oh, so the next book I read was The Burning God by R.F. Kuang. I finally finished the Poppy War series. And in the past, I have said that, like, yeah, this is a good series. It's, it's really well written. It's, you know, not my favorite favorite. It's very military heavy, whatever. Um, okay, and this is the book that finally sold me. <laughs> um, and, I mean, it was kind of like, maybe the first third, I was kind of like, it's more military, it's more military. Okay, okay, I, I'm i just not super into something that's super military heavy. It's like, I wanted le less military and more fantasy. Um, and then we definitely got more of that in the book. The thing that sold me was when it finally clicked for me. Rin is, Rin is the villain. This is a villain origin story. I don't know why that felt like such a revelation and why it fucking took me that long. 
Because, I mean, it's marketed as, and people talk about, like, well, you know, she's a very morally gray character. She makes a lot of decisions I don't agree with. But, and, you know, I was like, yeah, I agree with that. And I'm like, but what's the fucking big deal? But there's something about framing it as, no, this is a villain origin story. And it's the kind of villain I like, who is complex, who doesn't see themselves as a villain. Um, because you could argue in this book, like, she's not the villain she's fighting against something worse i'm like but they also make it very fucking clear that the peasants at the bottom of the ladder they don't fucking care who's in charge because for them it's the same they're exploited and they're starved and they're driven from their lands and everything is fucking difficult and awful it doesn't fucking matter who's in charge their lives are upended in someone else's power struggle um so the idea of like Rin fighting against something worse. It's like, but is she? I mean, if you're standing on the other side watching her burn fucking cities to the ground, why would you think that she's better? <laughs> um, so there was, there was something about just thinking about this as a villain origin story that suddenly made the story much more compelling because we are seeing we're, we are seeing things like from her perspective of how she is trying to do right, how she does think she's fighting against worse circumstances. And maybe she is, but her methods are questionable. And at some point you just have done so much damage that there's no coming back from it. And um, it, 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 this story does a great job of like recognizing the epic tragedy of that. And I say epic tragedy in, ter in terms of like you know, the the classic epic Greek tragedies, you know, the downfall of this powerful figure because of their hubris, because of their pride, because of their quest for revenge or whatever, and all, all it does is damage the world. Um, so anyway, took me till book three. I finally fucking get, get it. <laughs> I get it. Okay. Great. Um, okay. Uh, so the next little book I finished, um, I bought some books and I picked up this, uh, let's see, this little collector, collector's edition of the poem, The Hill We Climb by Amanda Gorman. Um, this was the book, the poem that she read at President Biden's inauguration. And I didn't really watch or listen to much of the inauguration, except when I was driving to work that morning. And I turned on the radio, they had just, she had just, they had, well, the station I was listening to had just started playing her poem. So her poem is pretty much the only part of the inauguration that I listened to. And then listening, I remember listening to it and being like, fuck yeah. Because it, like, the, it, it was so much of the relief of at least climbing out of the hole we were in. Now, whether or not we've climbed into another hole, time will tell. Um, and like recognizing the relief and the sense of hope, but also recognizing the harm that had, be do had been done and recognizing it's hard work. Like, you know, ma making a country whole is hard work. Um, but also like we've come this far, we're clearly fucking up to the task. And it was just like the perfect, there was just like the perfect tone. She really captured this moment, <laughs> the complexity and the promise and the pain of this moment in our history. So huzzah. Okay. Okay. Oops. Oh no. I had three DNFs this month. So I read 13 books. Okay. Uh, the next book I picked up was a uh, free ebook of Masquerade by Victoria Vale. This is a very, very smutty uh, historical romance. Um, I DNF'd it because it was like 90% romance, and, or 90% steam, and the rest of the story I didn't care about. <laughs> we'll just leave it there. Um, okay, so the next book. I read was Cool for the Summer by Dahlia Adler. Oh, this, this was good. This was good. Um, this was a book I definitely wish I had had in high school. So this is about a teenage girl in her high school year 
who has been pining after this boy since like the sixth grade. Um, and then the summer before high school, <clears throat> she is at a uh, vacation house with her mom. It's it, the home belongs to her mom's boss. Anyway, um, and she has a romantic relationship with a girl out there. Um, but then she believes that at the end of the summer, they're never going to see each other again. So she just goes back to her normal life. The boy of her dreams starts paying her attention. Um, she's like, oh my god, I'm going to get everything I wanted. And then the girl from the summer shows up at her school. And she's now confronted with this past that she thought she was going to be able to leave behind, still being there, and then like having to deal with having to reevaluate the th the thing that she wanted might not be the thing that she wants anymore and learning to adjust to that realization and um a big a big theme in this is like she kind of has trouble identifying as bisexual because her experience with it is not what she has seen in other people um and I think that's that's very important representation that um, your own experience is valid, even if it's not quite what you imagined it would be or what you have seen before. It's, it's a YA contemporary and um, I kind of struggled with it at the beginning because there was something about it that was just making me flash back <laughs> to high school so much, which is not... A time in my life you could pay me to go back to um, but I think that that um, speaks to the author capturing this age and this time of change in a person's life effectively um, <laughs> but overall it was a good book and I think it um, yeah I'm glad I read it I'm glad it got put on my radar because um, like YA contemporary is not really something I read a lot I'll make my exceptions for my bisexual babes. Okay. Great. Okay, now we've got another couple of DNFs. Um, and I DNFed uh, Sleep Well, My Lady by Cray. Uh, this is a book I found in a little free library. Um, I got like a quarter of the way into it, and I just really did not like the writing style. And we get like a full quarter of the way into the book before we meet our main investigator, which just felt weird. <laughs> um, anyway, I, I just, yeah, I just really didn't like the writing. It was kind of clunky and um, I felt like the red herrings and the, you know, potentially this is why this person's a suspect and this is why that person is a suspect. I felt like all of those details just felt too obvious they were just highlighted it's just like I know that's going to become relevant I know that's going to become relevant later um and then also the characters were very shit very forward with information and it just felt like everything just felt too obvious for something that's supposed to be a murder mystery um and I just I read about a quarter of it and I wasn't engaged. Okay, I need to charge my phone. Where was I? Uh, okay, so the next DNF was uh, Butterfly Boy, Memories of a Chicano Mariposa by Rigoberto Gonzalez. This uh, is a memoir. Um, this was a book on my Amnesia Reads project. Um, I will have that video project or project video, whatever the video where I talk about it linked in my description box below um so I got yeah I got like halfway through it just about um and decided that I just didn't care <laughs> um like it's it's well written um it's it's just that it's it's a very just personal life memoir and there are interesting aspects in there about um the author, he, he is a queer uh, Mexican man living in the United States. His family um, have a history of being uh, farm workers that come into the U.S. to work uh, in the, to, to work. Um, so 
you know, that kind of history combined with living in the U.S., being a queer man, um, there's, there's like relationships, there, him being a queer man, um, you know, his relationship with his father, they're like interesting things of how all of these things intersect. Um, but overall, it's kind of just a very small focus about this one person. And I definitely prefer my memoirs where, you know, the story of this person's life is kind of connected to these broader themes or this larger historical context or something. Um, yeah. And uh, supposedly this author has written other things and maybe if I was more familiar with his other work and I was more interested in just learning more about this author, I, I would uh, be more interested in it, but I was just like, so many books, so little time, someone else is going to enjoy this much more than I will. So DNF and, you know, I'll either try to sell it or put it in a free library and someone else will hopefully enjoy it. Okay, great. Uh, the next book I read uh, was The Lord I Left by Scarlett Peckham. This is the third book in the... The Secrets of Charlotte Street. It's a trilogy um, of historical romance. Um, this was by far my favorite of the series. Like I had these moments where I'm like, oh no, not me having all of the feelings. Why am I so invested in this? Um, it's it's a little bit steamy, but def I think of the series, it kind of takes the longest to get there. Um, so this one is about... So sure, the whole series revolves around these characters who are connected to um, what is essentially a BDSM club, um, a whipping house that, um, of course, is very scandalous if anyone, one, knew of its existence, and two, knew who partook of it. Um, so the story revolves around a, what is his title? A vicar? I don't know. A ordained person who is working with the House of Lords to try and do something about, you know, the vices of the city. Um, and he is in contact with the people of this house to try and like learn about, you know, what what is actually going to be the most good? Do we need to just shut this stuff down and penalize these people who are, you know, uh, who are prostitutes, who are selling drink, who are using drugs or whatever? Um, or would that actually cause harm? And do we need to like, um, you know, provide state sanctioned medical care for them? So it's like, it's a, it's a conversation that's actually quite relevant to today. Um, so that's his connection to the house. Um, and then our female lead is uh, a woman who is in training to become a governess of the house, uh, but she's not fully trained yet. Um, and they have a journey of proximity when she gets word that her mother is ill and she needs to get there as fast as possible. It is winter, things are snowing, he's on his way to another family thing so it's in the right direction so they are now traveling together and they're kind of like people on opposite sides of this moral conundrum at least as it starts um, and over time they kind of um, find their own middle ground and there was a lot in I think this part of why I loved it is there's a lot in here about religion and faith and it does the thing I fucking love where it separates the concept of re re organized religion and the concept of having faith that they are separate things they're related but they are separate um, and it is it is this journey of this person, the man who tries to be so welcoming and patient to his congregation, because a lot of his congregation are, you know, prostitutes and other impoverished people and other people of <laughs> dubious backgrounds. And he's kind of like telling them that like, it doesn't matter where you've been. The whole point of like God's love is that he will forgive you and he will, um, you know, his, his love for you like always exists and, and um, you know, who you've been or who you are is not a reason to feel less than in the eyes of God. But he, so he has that with other people, but then on himself, he has this 
restrictive self-discipline because he has such pro um such tensions and doubts and whatever with his own faith at odds with his own desires so it's kind of this journey of him realizing that like this generosity that he has given to other people is something that he should also give to himself um and the the woman kind of helps him realize this um and yeah and there's a lot in there about um having tensions with your family because of having tensions with your family and your family definitely not understanding and or being supportive of who you are and what you want in life and what you fucking don't want in your life um so these they very much bond over um that common background um and the way that they definitely like develop this like friendship and alliance like the way like the woman stands up for the guy in front of his shit this like ass wipe of a father of his um and the way that like vice versa like the mother does something kind of shitty to her daughter and the guy is kind of like that was shitty she has every fucking right to be upset because that was not cool um so just like the you know it's not even quite like enemies to lovers it is people who which I, i've said this before about the series but it's definitely a series of like people who have misinterpreted each other discovering each other and discovering like the common ground between them and um yeah <laughs> this was my favorite in the series um it's great i am so happy for them <laughs> all right great um so the next book i finished i listened to the audiobook of 400 souls edited by Eber Mex Kendi and Keisha and Blaine narrated by many <laughs> um so this is an anthology of what is hold on what is the like tagline 400 souls a community history of African America 1619 to 2019 so the so this is um so that timeline is broken up into each chapter kind of represents five years and each one has a different author and the audiobook has a different narrator for each one so the amount of black american talent in this one book is astounding it is great <laughs> um so this is this is not even though it is kind of like this community history and it, it's kind of representative of these five-year chunks. It's not a names, dates, places, linear history. If you want that um, stamped from the beginning, we'll give you more of that. What this is, is more of a filling in the blanks of the history that this community has often been excluded from telling. So, um, like it makes this f history feel whole it takes, um, this is like the only one I have some notes for. So uh, it takes events, people, and policy, and it makes them personal, either personal to the author or personal to things that are still happening today. Um, nearly every chapter illustrates the way this history has ramifications through today. So, um, uh, so, you know, the, the, one of the, the segments that stands out to me is written by Ijoma Oluo. And she talks about how even though she has a white mother and a black father, she cannot claim to be half white because the way racist ideas and racist policy have treated um, blackness and um, mixed children and mixed marriages and stuff, it has turned whiteness into something that cannot be shared. It is only something that can be detracted from. So even though, yes, genetically she's half white, history or like our, our society has been shaped in the way that she will always. Oh, my partner's home. <laughs> okay, stand. Okay, you might hear the shower go at some point. I just filmed for like eight minutes and it wasn't recording. Anyway, so um, Ijoma, she can never actually be seen as half white because society has just not been set up to view 
view uh, mixed race children in that light. Um, so anyway, that's like an example of the way in which this is not just like a linear history, but it's kind of taking like a certain idea or a certain law or a certain event and kind of showing how it has shaped um, the black experience and black identity in this country. Um, so yeah, I definitely think this is a fantastic anthology, a fantastic collection of work, of ideas. I definitely feel like it it builds on historical work that already exists and it adds something new and it adds something quite necessary. So I highly, I highly recommend. <laughs> um, so hurrah, great. All right, uh, the next book I finished was The Last Wish by Andrzej Sapowski. Um, I've looked it up and even <laughs> that name is definitely pron is pronounced Andre. I wouldn't guess that from the spelling, but I looked it up. So, uh, so this is a, a book from The Witcher series, which was originally books, then a video game, then a Netflix series. Um, so this is, there's, there's the books that happen chronologically in the story, and then there's the order in which the books are written. So there's like two collections of like sort of short stories, and then there's like actual novels. Um, so this is one of the ones that's kind of short stories. It's it it's it's a format that's very like the show, where it's like there is kind of like an overarching plot line that kind of is interspersed with these like side quests, <laughs> these side tangents, but they all kind of build up into this world. Um, I actually really enjoyed this. I had I had heard some people criticize like the writing and stuff before, or like have some criticisms with, with it before. Um, but I actually really enjoyed this. I found it surprisingly funny in a way that I feel like the show really captured it. This is like this weird, dry, kind of sarcastic humor. Um, there's one story in here that's not in the show where um, uh, the witcher, what's his name? <laughs> Gerald is conversing with a monster and the monster is like, what are you? And the witcher's like, hey, well, look at my, don't you know what I am? Look at my insignia, which is like the shape of the wolf that is his witcher insignia. And then like the monster is like, what, are, do you come from like a family of muzzle makers or something? I, I, I don't know, it makes sense in my brain. <laughs> um, I will say that this, uh, the writing is very, dialogue driven very very dialogue driven um which does mean that sometimes the characters go on a bit too long and get a bit distracted before they come around to their point um so you know that style is not going to be for everybody but um yeah and i i did really like the consistent theme of the witchers were created for a world of monsters and the world is changing and there's a lot in here about like the nature of monstrosity where like you know often he like his line of work is misinterpreted as like he's a hitman for hire and he's like and someone will hire him to like hire kill a person and he's like no i don't kill people i kill monsters and then you would get into the discussion of like okay but what about the people the humans who do monstrous things like where is that line the world is changing and the world doesn't really have need of a witcher the way it used to and just kind of the, uh, the, the angst of that, or just like the tension of that. Um, anyway, I liked it. Great. I will continue. I will continue to read the books in the series. Um, and also it's convenient because they are translated into English and that fills my wanting to read more translated books prompt with fantasy. Hurrah. <laughs> Great. Okay. Uh, mm -mm. All right. The next book I finished was Hoyos, which is Spanish for Holes by Louis Sachar. Sachar? Sachar. Um, so this is a beloved book from my childhood. And I have a goal of trying to read four books in Spanish this year. Um, so upon rereading this, I was like, oh shit, this is a much darker story than I remember. Because we're dealing with... Um, an unjust justice system. We're dealing with child homelessness, child abuse, child neglect, child, uh, children in 
um, you know, juvenile detention centers, um, the use of child prisoners as essentially slave labor, um, and then in other timeline, other stories that are, revolve around our central story, we are dealing with racism, particularly towards um, interracial relationships, and there is a very slight attempt at, at sexual assault, um, and yeah, it's dark. <laughs> Um, this has a very, like, folk tale, tall tale quality to it. You know, that kind of, like, grandpa telling you a story about that time he wrestled with a giant fish for three days. And you're like, sure you did, grandpa. Three days. That's exactly how it happened. Um, like, you know the story is based on truth, but you're like, it couldn't have... It's like, it kind of like um, Big Fish. That movie where it's like you don't think the story could possibly be real and then if you actually dug into it you're like oh wait all those things there is like evidence to support that the story is the story told was not so far from the truth anyway there is something about this story and like the various stories of characters in the past that has that feel to it um with this like kind of a tall tale aspect but much of the story deals in mostly modern times like pre-cell phones. When was this actually written? Stand by. Uh, 1998. Um, so, yeah, I, I felt like the, the, the things that didn't hold up for t today was Stanley talks about how his great, great, great grandfather, uh, had a, uh, had a curse put on him by a Romani woman, but they do not use the word Romani. Um, so that hasn't aged super well. Um, I do, I do enjoy how that storyline is connected to, um, the modern times with the characters following Stanley's storyline. So I like how, like, that story gets resolved. I just don't like that it kind of hinges on this racist stereotype. Um, so that didn't age too well. Um, and then there are a few, because we're dealing with kids in the criminal justice system, there's definitely probably a disproportionate number of non-white kids, black kids, and Latino kids in this, um, labor camp, for lack of a better, uh, description. Um, and, uh, there is a moment where, like, the dynamic, like, the, the question of, like, privilege, the question of you know, the behavior of a white person versus a, a white kid versus a black kid. Like, there is a conversation about that, but it's very much revolves around, like, a specific thing that's happening. And, like, it's great to have that conversation kind of brought up there, but I felt like it was kind of skipped over in the implications of the whole story. Um, but, you know, this book is 20 years old, so, like, I'm not... It, that that's just not something that like was seen so much 20 years ago if this book was written today i would kind of be like you kind of need to keep like the energy of that scene in critiquing all the things that are happening throughout the whole story um but like it's kind of mentioned but um not as thoroughly as i would hold it to by today's standards um but anyway, overall, I mean, I'd, I'd read the original book like four or five times. I'd seen the movie, I'd seen the play, C.L. Children's Theater did a really great stage adaptation of it when I was young. Um, so, yeah, great. We're almost there. Two more. <sighs> okay, so the next book I finished was The Romance of The Lady's Guide to Celestial Mechanics by Olivia Waite. This... It's not just one of, like, my favorite romances I've read all year. It might be one of my favorite books I've read all year. Because the, the talk of science, <laughs> the talk of women in science, the talk of queer women in science, the talk of the erasure of women in science, um, like, it's definitely a romance. Um, it's, it's definitely a bit more than a historical story with romance in it. Like, the romance is pretty central, but... 
the world around it, the, so the, it revolves around a woman who takes on translating this book about this a uh, book about astrophysics. I don't know if it was quite called, excuse me, I don't know if it was quite called astrophysics yet at the time, but um, this very uh, important astronomy text, she <clears throat> she wants to translate it for this uh, club of scientific gentlemen, but of course, you know, she, and she goes in there expecting to have to like prove that she has the mathematical and scientific knowledge to be qualified to do it. And then it becomes a debate of whether or not she as a woman has a right to exist in that room at all. So this book filled me with so much rage <laughs> from the sexism that um, is not so surprising. But, you know, in those moments, it's just like, like, you're not supposed to question my, you're not supposed to question whether I have intelligence at all. You're supposed to question whether my intelligence is the caliber that you need. <laughs> so anyway, um, but then she has a uh, very wealthy other female benefactor who decides just finance the project on her own and she's able to do it. And then of course they get into a relationship with each other um, and it is a beautiful tale about the 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 beauty of science there's a be wonderful conversation in here about the value of science and the value of art and who gets to call themselves an artist um, because the lady benefactor is a very beautiful very talented embroidery artist so there's like this whole thread about her claiming her identity as an artist even though embroidery is not seen as socially acceptable as a fine art so there's a great conversation in there about that um, and then great conversations about you know queerness and how queer people have always existed and have always found a way to exist and even though um, their stories have been hidden um, that doesn't make their relationships any less valid and um, and that kind of is parallel to women who have made contributions to science before just this was it was great it was great <laughs> I loved it so much. All right, so <laughs> the last book I finished uh, is another beloved. I reread The Fifth Season by N.K. Jemisin um, because I have um, The Obelisk Gate and The Stone Sky, and I it, it's time for me to fucking re read them. But it had been long enough. I'm really glad I reread this because I, I had lost quite a few details. Um, but also just, I fucking love this world. <laughs> Um, I love putting the pieces together of this world because a lot, a lot of the story is the way that these climate catastrophes have erased a lot of history and that question of um, the things that we have been told about the past, the things we have been told about the way things always are. How the fuck do we know? <laughs> if, you know, every couple hundred of years everything fucking like has to start over um so but shit anyway yeah i fucking love the series i look and i'm so excited to <laughs> continue with it and um yeah so it's like this was just like a six out of five stars the first time i read it and the second time i read it so hurrah great okay we're finally done. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you have a good rest of your day. I encourage you to go out into the world and be curious. I will have my other social media places linked in the description box below if you want to connect with me elsewhere. And I will catch you folks in my next video. Bye!